Good morning, and uh, especially to all of you that are at home joining us too, because you're lucky today. You get to really enjoy some fine music, <laughs> even more fine than usual. Let me clarify that. It's always fine, but we're glad you can be with us this morning as we have our orchestra. We have our choir back in full force, it seems, and everyone seems to be doing fairly well because at least the sun shines out for a little while, for a short while. We're here, and this is the third Sunday in Lent, and as you may or may not remember, we are looking at some of the things that we believe God would like us to give up, not just for Lent, but throughout our entire lives. So listen carefully to this morning to our message, and let us now take time to worship God.
If you will, please stand now, either in body or in spirit, and let's join together in our call to worship. As a deer longs for flowing streams, Our souls thirst for God, for the living God. the sound people make after the sermon, <laughs> not after the songs. Come on down, kids. Those of you that were good enough to get up bright and early on this Daylight Saving Sunday. <sighs> I'm sitting this way. You're fine. You're, you did it right. You're the right, you did it just right. James, you're yawning. What's the matter? A little tired? I know time's hard. Oh. All right, I've got a question for you. Oh. Have you ever had somebody that really scared you? 
there anything that really scares you at all? Yes. What's that? Nothing scares me. And nothing scares me. And I thought I was going home. And then my daddy woke me up. Oh, you had a, so you had a bad dream? Yeah. And dad woke you up and took care of you. Did it, feel, did it feel better when Dad was there? He, he gets what I thought. Any people ever scare any of you? Well, you're a lucky group if nothing scares you. I know a guy who used to scare people all the time. He was bigger than I am, taller, wider. And everyone thought he was just the scariest looking person they ever saw. But we, have a, we had a nickname for him. Big Softy. Because everyone didn't know that he was probably as nice as anybody could be. He would never try to scare anybody. But sometimes we get to see people that we think are look, look different from us. Or sometimes they look big and they look, look scary. But if we just take the time to get to know them, it turns out they're not so scary after all. I have a brother and sister at my house, and I see children at my house. You did? <laughs> well, I tell you, there's, there's nothing much. <laughs> okay, Weston, sister can't take care of you. Oh, well, you're all lucky because you've got people, lots of people to take care of you and make you feel good. But if you, anybody ever scares you, like another kid sometimes in classes, you just need to get a chance to get to know them sometimes, and maybe you'll find out they're not so scary after all. Let's, <laughs> quick, they're on the run. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you let us have the opportunity to get to know people, even if they're a little scary sometimes, because we want to know and make people our friends, just as Jesus made all of us his friend. Amen. Okay, guys. You go. Good job, Neil. <laughs> Once again, we come to worship, and one of the things we always do, especially early on, is to try and clear our heads of some of the things that we have stuck in there, like some misconceptions, maybe some guilt over some things we've done. Let's join together now in this prayer of confession, which is something that all of us in society can share. Gracious God, as we wander through the wilderness this Lent, we are more aware of our thirst for your presence, your love, your guidance on life's journey. Forgive us for turning away from you. Forgive our doubt and uncertainty that led us to place our faith in worldly comforts that don't run deep enough and don't last. We come to your well today desperate and thirsty for Christ's living water. Quench our thirst, we pray. Grant us your forgiveness and your grace. Amen. We turn to God with a prayer of confession not because God doesn't know what we're already thinking or know that what we've already done, but by doing so, we admit that there are things we could be doing better in our lives and God empowers us to go forth as forgiven and loved people. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. Now please take a moment to share a sign of peace with those around you.
taken from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For the judgment you give will be the judgment you get, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye?
The second scripture lesson is taken from Romans chapter 12, verses 15 through 17. Rejoice for those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be arrogant, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. Human beings are built to size each other up quickly. These first impressions are influenced by a number of factors such as facial shape, vocal inflection, attractiveness, and general emotional state. People tend to get attached to their initial impressions of others and find it very difficult to change their opinion, even when pressed, presented with lots of evidence to the contrary. That description of first impressions comes from the staff at the magazine Psychology Today, and it's pretty simple. And they go on to say, as a result, it's important to be aware of how one comes across to others during a first meeting. Then one can employ impression management skills. Impression management skills, wow, what a thing. Modulating any irritating traits and accentuating one's strengths to ensure that people have a more reasonable and favorable opinion of you. In other words, it's your responsibility to create a favorable first impression with others. Now, that's a pretty practical approach designed to help people overcome unnecessary obstacles, whether it be in life, love, or work. There is something, however, very wrong about that. I looked at that description again. These first impressions are influenced by a number of factors such as facial shape, vocal inflection, attractiveness, and general emotional state. Consider how many of those elements you don't have any control over. I mean, your facial shape is determined by genetics, and you really can't change that unless you want to spend a lot of money on plastic surgery. Vocal inflection, well, again, that's most influenced by both genetics and where you grew up at. And it's especially hard to change that over the years. Attractiveness, well, that's influenced by a ton of different societal standards, what era a person lives in or what generation they come from. Some of the models that are considered super attractive today, if in the time of Botticelli, would have been said, oh, there's something wrong with them, they're too skinny. We like our women round. Or men were considered weak if they were too fair-skinned. Well, people tend to get attached, to says, to their initial impression of others and find it difficult to change their opinion even when presented with lots of evidence to the contrary. Back when I was in college, about the same time of year, spring break, I made a trip across the state of Iowa with a good friend and my girlfriend. The three of us left Northwest Iowa, and I was going to go spend the week with my friend in Southeast Iowa. And it was going to be time where we'd spend just a little, we didn't have, we didn't do any of this traveling off to Mexico or Daytona Beach. We were, we were in Iowa. We're a little more practical. We're just going to go home for a week, take it easy. I went with him, in fact, I went with him to his mother. It went my first time I went to a four-square gospel church. That's a story for another time. <laughs> but anyway, my girlfriend lived in northeast Iowa, and so we made a detour so we could drop her off so she could spend the week with her family. Because of that detour, we drove most of the time on two-lane highways, and we didn't make really great time. In fact, we were late for dropping her off at her family's. Her mother, whom I'd only talked to on the telephone before that and never met in person, was not happy. Being from Iowa, she'd made a casserole for lunch. 
And being late, the casserole was now overdone. She was most concerned about looking bad. And because of this, she treated my friend and I rather coldly until we finally left and went on our trip the rest of the way. At least that's what I assumed was the problem. But my girlfriend told me later there was something more to it than that. Now, we'd had a late night before we began that trip that day. And after six hours on the road, I was a little tired by the time we got to her family's. Well, because of that, my girlfriend's mother had noticed something about me that was unforgivable. When I'm tired, one eyelid droops a little more than the other. (laughs) It turns out I shared that trait with her (laughs) ex-husband. And so because I shared that physical trait, I automatically had all of his other faults too. And to God on that one. There was no way to change anybody's mind. During the season of Lent, as I mentioned, we've been looking at things that God wants us to give up, not just for Lent, but during our entire lives. And this week, our subject is preconceptions or jumping to conclusions. We've all seen or heard or read about or even experienced some difficult situations like that. And processing those preconceptions can be impossible. Overcoming is just beyond our ability. But we've also been the people jumping to conclusions, not just the recipients. Unable to change our minds. If you watch TV shows like Dateline, 48 Hours, or 2020, you know that there have been a lot of serious problems that these preconceptions can cause. Too many times people have been convicted of crimes that an eyewitness said it had to be them. They were just sure it was that person. Only to find out later it was not because of malicious intent, but just because they had it locked in their head that that had to be the person. It turned out it wasn't. There are lots of tales in society. It's interesting to me to look back at our history and to recognize how many ways we have institutionalized to a degree, our preconceptions and our misconceptions of other people. There was the time when our government passed a law not allowing people of Asian descent to own property. There are those times when the Irish people were first coming to the uh, United States and everyone complained because they said, oh, there's, they're just this terrible people. They low life, they don't want to work hard. In fact, they comp- I saw a newspaper article from back in that time period where they said, this person is just like the African American. And that was, their, that's their, that was their way of saying so, obviously, this person can't be trusted. Look at the way we've treated Jews, Italians, African Americans, women, Muslims, There's the story of the Sikhs who were killed here in Kansas because they were mistaken for Muslims. How many times have we gotten into our heads that there's something wrong with somebody, there's something dangerous about it, and we just can't begin to change our minds? There's also examples of preconceptions, though, in the Bible. One of the best known is in the first chapter of John when Jesus is first calling his disciples. Jesus had turned to Philip, who was from the same hometown as Andrew and Simon, and simply said to him, follow me. But Philip was so excited, he ran to turn to his friend Nathaniel and said, we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. And do you remember how Nathaniel replied, can anything good come from Nazareth? People from Nazareth, people from Galilee were looked down upon by a lot of other people around there. How many other people do you suppose had that same attitude when they heard that Jesus was from Nazareth and they never went any further even listening to him? Come along, we're going to go hear what the wonderful words and message that this prophet has to tell us about. Which prophet's that? Jesus of Nazareth. 
no, no, not going to do that. You know what all those people from Nazareth are. You can't believe a word they say. There's also the story of Jesus teaching in Nazareth itself. It's found in Luke's gospel. If you remember, Jesus had been teaching in synagogues in the region around Nazareth and had been widely received with lots of praise. And so he goes to his hometown in Nazareth, and he preaches there. And at first, it seems like everything's going to be positive. It says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. But just as quickly, they come up with, wait, isn't this Joseph's son? When Jesus would go on to explain to them why previous prophets had been rejected in their hometowns, the crowd became angry and wanted to throw him off a cliff. And Jesus somehow miraculously escaped them, but he never returned to Nazareth again. All of these examples from society and the Bible show preconceptions at their worst. And it's easy to understand how God would want us to stop doing these kinds of things. Our preconceptions, our prejudging of others. I think it's even more important now, though, with the many divisions that we have going on in the world, in our society, in our country. What are the preconceptions you think we might have of people today? If I say the word or the phrase MAGA Republicans, what comes to mind? Liberal Democrats, gay activists, transgendered. For some people, there's a real gut reaction upon hearing some of those phrases, and we've made up our minds exactly what people are going to be like. Back when our church and I mean the Presbyterian Church USA, was wrestling with whether or not to accept gays and lesbians and other differently gendered people into the ministry of the church, whether we'd allow marriage to take place. It was quite a, it was quite a, quite a difficult situation and quite difficult conversations were had during that time. And we see that same thing going on in the Methodist Church today and see the great division that's called, but I was in New Jersey at the time, Sue and I, and I think what was interesting about our presbytery was we had a gathering where we tried to make sure we had as many people there from all the different congregations. We broke up into small groups and we had discussions where we didn't, it wasn't a matter of sitting there trying to convince the other person, but we just simply told each of us our story about why we could or could not support that stance. And it was so surprising how many people had stories about family members or close friends, people they loved and cared for who were members of the LGBTQ community, and explained that's why they had changed their mind on some of these things, and because it had allowed them to see the Bible maybe in a different way too to recognize that God's love for everyone wasn't well, something that came with, well, restrictions. And so because of that, we still had a somewhat contentious vote, but only slightly. And in the end, everyone walked out of there feeling that at least we had been heard because we took the time to listen to someone. Now, that doesn't mean that we agreed on everything, but at the very least, we took the time to listen to somebody else. I think there's just way too many times, whether it's in society, whether it's within congregations, at work, wherever, where we get the idea that somebody's doing something and because of that, they must, there must be something wrong with them. I don't like that person. Why don't you like them? Well, because you know what they do. What? They don't make the coffee the right way. <laughs> really? Or, I've never been able to get along with Judy since that big, big discussion we had at church that 
put us on both sides, different sides of the issue. And I said, what was that? The color of the carpet. <laughs> oh. It's surprising how many things we come up with that are barriers to us being able to truly have conversations with each other, to understand each other. In that series there, it says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. I especially like the line, though, from this is, again, from the new Revised Standard Version, the updated edition. For the judgment you give will be the judgment you get, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. I don't think it's a way of saying that this is what God's going to do to you then because of the way you treated others, as much as it is to say, if you are judgmental of somebody else. If you come with your preconceived ideas of who they are and what they want to do with their life, there's no way that they can't do the same to you. But if you're willing to open yourself up to conversations, to discussions, to try and understand what fears... I think one of the things I've discovered most of all is that there's a lot of times people that I have a disagreement with we find out that we each have things that we're concerned about and we're afraid are going to happen. And it's those fears that make us get so rigid. It's those fears that make us feel like there's no chance for any compromise or there's no chance that the other person might have a point. But God doesn't want us to live that way. Jesus didn't want us to live that way. How many times did Jesus listen to somebody and change his mind? That's why some of my favorite parts of the Bible, those times where, because we say, oh, Jesus being, with God, being one with God was no everything. And how about that time when he talked to the Samaritan woman? Where he changed his mind about how he dealt not only with women, but maybe with the people from Samaria itself people who were considered to be, of course, very different from the Jewish people. Jews and Samaritans didn't get along. And the silly part is when you finally really do some research and you find out it's only because one of them believed that the temp proper worship was to be done in the temple and Samaritans thought it should take place at a location in their country. Otherwise, same rituals, same worship, same God that they worshipped. We pick up the newspapers and we turn on the TV and it's, it's pretty depressing sometimes. Not just because of bad things that happen, but I think because of the way I see people treating one another and acting towards each other. There's nothing better than to watch somebody, though, who opens themselves up and says, you know, this is what I believe. Now, I'm not necessarily right, but this is what I believe, and this is why I believe it. And when we have those kinds of conversations, that's when we become to really understanding of who other people are. And they also understand us, too. Maybe, they, maybe we don't want them to know who we are. That Because that means you have to be a little bit vulnerable. But the example that Jesus gave to us do not judge unless you want to be judged in that same way. And the idea of God's unlimited love and forgiveness and grace that we were supposed to emulate, well, I think it's easy to see which would be the best thing to give up. Do you give up the grace or do you give up the preconceptions? The choice is ours. Amen. It's time now for our prayers of the people, and I'd ask you to keep in mind people that are listed in your bulletin, but also the many people that I know we have in the prayer chain, the people that we've, some of us have shared information about, and others who have asked, they said, please don't uh, share my information with the congregation, but just keep me in your prayers. Well, keep those unnamed people in your prayers as we begin. Loving and caring God. 
Help us to come to you as people who see with your eyes, that see the value and the worth of other people, that we don't automatically jump to conclusions based on how they're dressed or their racial backgrounds, by what they wear, what they drive. All those things are things we created to get in the way. Too often our portions of our brain, which are designed to tell us whether to fight or flee, use those preconceptions and it leads to fighting. We need a part of our brain to take over that says engage. We come to you hoping that you will use your spirit as always to strengthen us, not to force us into a way of living or force us into seeing things your way, but opening our eyes so that we do understand the value of others. Because if we can learn to understand the values of others, we may also learn to understand the value of ourselves and have a little better understanding of how God can love us so much. We pray for all those, especially, who are undergoing physical, mental, emotional illnesses, who would really feel the need for healing We pray that your spirit will strengthen them. We also pray that whenever we have the capability, whenever we have the knowledge, that we will reach out to those in need and share our love with them, both in deed and in words. Help us to be a factor of change in the world. Help us not to just simply continue on the same ways of discourse with the same ways of conflict, but to help us to find a way to be truly different. To be the people you created us to be, not the people who fight and argue and are contentious with one another. Whether it be as Americans, whether it be as human beings from wherever in the world. Help us to treat each other with respect and dignity. Help us to raise our children with that kind of respect and dignity and love. And in all things, make us aware that your son Jesus Christ came to show us that there is nothing that can separate us from your love, not in life or in death. And for that love, that great ministry, we give thanks in his name. Amen. One of the ways we support each other within this congregation, as always, is in sharing our financial resources. If you're at home, there are ways you can do that by looking on the bulletins that you can find online. There are places on our website to give. And those of us here, can. there are many ways we can give, but the best way you can do is to give from the heart. Please, be generous.
First of all, I want to thank again Pam Kelly and the orchestra because, gosh, you guys are good. <laughs> See, I've been lucky enough to hear quite a few orchestras in my lifetime. It's amazing how much sound you guys get out. You sound like you're twice as big. <laughs> you do. You have a great sound. And it's nice to see, of course, all of our church members that I spot within the orchestra, but it's really especially we feel blessed to have all the rest of you take your time to be with us on a Sunday morning. We thank you so much. No. <laughs> oh. He wanted me to whisper in his ear. I'm not doing that here. Just want to remind you that this morning we begin our new members classes, which are in room five. And room five is in the music wing. It's the very last classroom on the right-hand side from this direction. So we hope that, um, that our new folks will join us. But also, if you are with us in worship and would like to attend the class, you are more than welcome to come and join us. And then also for um, any of our children who may be in Sunday school, which is going to be slim today, um, I didn't, wasn't able to get the signs changed down at the bottom of the steps, so be sure and check. Um, the classrooms will be in room 10 and 14. Um, check to make sure you know which one is the right one for your children this morning. And you have the other adults class? The other adult classes um, in room three and room four. Three is follow me on spiritual practices, which is especially appropriate for the season of Lent. And four, inhabiting Eden, which is a look at the Old Testament text behind um, earth care and why we do the things we do to care for the environment. Both of those will be online, so if you are worshiping with us at home, you can find those links on the midweek announcements or on the uh, bulletin information and in, uh, the, on the website. And knowing our friend Kim, they're probably available on the Facebook page. Thank you. Thank you. Take the time to nuzzle up against your husband. <laughs> uh, you know, this week is also St. Patrick's Day on Friday, and even if you're not Irish, we all celebrate it, so. And I have to give thanks because it was my... Uh, Great great grandmother was Bridget Margaret Powers. And her parents had come over during the potato famine. So we are thankful for their, everything that comes from Ireland. But I think, especially today, I, again, I do hope that we will work on some of the preconceptions that we bring to the table. All of us do. And sometimes they, have a, they serve a very good purpose. There's so many times when they do nothing but get in the way of what we can do together as human beings. I mean, I think if we just all got over some of those difficulties, we might find out that we go a lot further together than we thought. That we don't have to agree on every last little detail, but we do have to respect one another. Because all of you were created in the image of God. All of you are loved by God equally. So when you leave this place, just remember that whether you're leaving this building, whether you're leaving your home after having watched online worship, whatever you're doing this week, remember you are the bearers of God's love into the world. The peace of Jesus Christ is yours for the asking, but most of all, the power of the Holy Spirit surrounds you and makes impossible things possible.